Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out to learn a little bit more about Amazon Workspaces. I'm Nathan Thomas, the general manager of Amazon Workspaces. Hope everybody's having a really good reInvent show so far. Uh, getting towards the uh, end of the week, just a couple more sessions to go, so uh, hang in there. Uh, I know I'm looking forward to, to going to see Skrillex tonight at Replay, uh, so have a little bit of fun as well as getting to learn a lot more about some of these uh, AWS services that we're launching. So today we're gonna be talking about how to move to Amazon Workspaces and replace your legacy VDI. So I'm really excited to be joined today by a few customers uh, who are gonna be helping tell some of their journey uh, moving to Amazon Workspaces. Uh, we're also gonna talk a little bit about how and why people are replacing VDI with Amazon Workspaces and talk a little bit about how to plan a migration. But of course, the real reason we wanna be here is to talk with these customers, uh, Guardian Life and KPMG. They're gonna walk a little bit through some of their journey, what they've done, how they've made these transitions, and you're gonna have a chance to ask questions of them at the end, assuming time allows, uh, and uh, hopefully get some perspective uh, from folks who've done some of these kind of maneuvers to move off of on-premises VDI towards the cloud. Before we get into that, I do wanna talk a little bit about why, though. So if you've ever been responsible for deploying and managing a VDI solution, you know that it's one of the most complicated tasks you can undertake. You're buying hardware, you're putting in a data center, you're establishing networking, you're managing disks, you've gotta make sure that everybody's got a great experience on those machines. And it's really tough to do globally, across the world, in any network conditions, from any device. It's a big challenge, it's a real complicated thing that you've gotta do. And the result has been that the value of VDI is really high on paper. There's a lot of promises that get made that it's gonna be great when you do your on-premises VDI deployments and set that up yourself. But in reality, doing it at effective scale and doing it globally it turns out to be pretty hard. And there's just a lot of stories of shelfware VDI deployments. So folks saying they're gonna roll out hundreds or thousands of users on VDI and then really getting pretty low uptake. So you just have a few users that use it regularly or only people that you can kind of make use it, <laughs> but the people who have the choice are not necessarily gonna use it. They're not gonna go use that uh, VDI solution versus doing a laptop. So it's a, a bit of an industry trend. We actually had to kind of fight against this with workspaces. VDI got a bit of a bad reputation due to a bunch of on-premises challenges Things like oversubscribed disks, oversubscribed CPU, poor networking, bad global distribution. So it's a really big challenge that's out there. So there's been a broad awareness of this unfulfilled promise of cost savings, global access, or simpler management. So all of those concepts that we all decided we were gonna go take advantage of really haven't been fulfilled very well. Now, this fulfills for me uh, what I consider sort of my law of the cloud, which is the harder a technology is to operate, the more sense it makes to consume it as a cloud service. Those are exactly the kind of things you don't wanna take on. You don't wanna have to go and build and manage those things. Ideally, you're focusing on your business, the things that you're trying to do as a company, not doing desktop and VDI deployment management. And so this is very much in that same vein for us. Uh, as you might imagine, we take that burden on, so we know a lot at this point about some of the challenges of rolling out large-scale VDI across the globe. It's hard to get accurate numbers, but I would assume we have the largest desktop deployment in the world uh, inside of the AWS cloud at this point with hundreds of thousands of workspaces and people connecting to that every single day to get their jobs done. So we've learned a lot about some of the challenges that are common in this space. This is a graph showing outgoing connections to workspaces. So these are active sessions to workspaces. This particular graph is for a single availability zone in the US East region uh, from May. Um, and what you're seeing here is a typical pattern of uh, customers or end users connecting to those workspaces, running for a while, and then disconnecting. And those periods are over the day. This is a really well-known phenomenon in the on-premises VDI world as well. A lot of people call it the Monday at 9 a.m. problem, uh, which is everybody comes in the office at 9 a.m. and they connect. And suddenly that infrastructure that you had that was sitting idle suddenly needs to handle a huge amount of burst all at once. So this particular graph does not start on Monday, it starts on Tuesday. Uh, but you've got Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you've got the weekend trough, and then you've got Monday, uh, I'm sorry, Tuesday, 
Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the trough, and then Monday uh, showing up at the end of it. And so the really tough spot gets to be this low point over the weekend, and then you pick up on Monday. So this means all of the networking gear needs to handle that load of all the streaming sessions. It means all of the servers need to be available to launch those workspaces. Of course, a lot of the workspaces are auto-stop workspaces now, so that means we're doing EC2 launches. Those need to recover in under 90 seconds in most cases, uh, so pretty fast expectation. It means all the disk infrastructure needs to be there to handle that. And so it really gets to be a pretty big challenge. And as much as we see it, uh, doing it yourself on premises is <laughs> incredibly challenging. So we do it globally uh, across the world, uh, and we get to take advantage of a lot of great things in the AWS space to help us do it. So where this really nets out for us is that what you really want is virtual desktops, not on-premises virtual desktop infrastructure. So that idea that, that virtual desktop uh, provides, that idea of remote access to anybody from any device when they need it, spin it up, pay for it when you're using it, shut it down, don't pay for it. That idea is really powerful. It's just that the cost of getting there in terms of the complexity and in terms of actual dollars is too high with on-premises VDI. And so that's why we see this transition towards Amazon Workspaces. So here we are. It's exactly what Amazon Workspaces provides. Spin it up, shut it down, and use Amazon Workspaces through the AWS console uh, or via our APIs in just a few minutes. So if you want to go launch a workspace today, uh, go to the console, log in. Typically, 15 minutes or so, you can launch your first one. Uh, if you uh, want to shut it down, you shut it down, you stop paying. Those are available in a few different uh, product modes. We'll get into those in a second. Um, but it's really designed to be very, very easy to get going and stand up infrastructure. And this has really resulted in some interesting uh, uh, kind of evolutions of the VDI market uh, in that we see a lot of people who run one, two, three, four, five, up to 10 or 15 uh, workspaces, which did not exist in the on-premises VDI market. Nobody was buying a hardware to go and stand up small counts of workspaces or small counts of uh, virtual desktops. Um, now, of course, our enterprise users you know, use thousands of these things, but it's really powerful to be able to go and do a very, very small scale deployment and have that be value that you get immediately. And so companies that otherwise wouldn't get any of these remote desktop concepts get it with Amazon Workspaces. So quickly, just in case anybody hasn't played with it or used it at all, uh, let me cover what an Amazon Workspace is now that I've been talking about it for uh, several minutes. So uh, Amazon Workspaces are very simply cloud desktops. It's a Windows or Linux system that you can connect to via a client. Those clients are available across multiple client devices, so uh, Windows boxes, Mac OS, Android devices, Chrome, also do uh, browser-based and zero client-based solutions. So a lot of different options to get to your workspace. And it should look and feel just like a Linux desktop or a Windows desktop always does. So it's a, just 100% a native experience is the goal for us. The clients kind of get out of the way, you interact with your desktop. So our goal is that those end users love that desktop. They love being able to get to it from anywhere. They love being able to disconnect, reconnect from home after the day is done, and all their apps are up and running. It's exactly the same way they left it. So pretty powerful. And of course, all the same normal cloud value propositions apply to workspaces, as you see with the other AWS services. Pay as you go. So when you're using workspaces, you can pay by the month or you can pay by the hour. When you stop using it, you stop paying for it. It's secure. So we use a, a broad range of technology to try and secure, to keep that uh, workspace secure. Uh, so that includes uh, authentication that's TLS based. It includes uh, streaming encryption, which is AES-256 based. All uh, you have options for doing encryption on disks uh, and you're running workspaces. And of course, most importantly, your data lives in the cloud. You're not taking your data and putting it on laptops or tablets and sending it outside of your building every day. That is, it's a pretty crazy concept uh, when you think about it, uh, taking that and putting it out in the world. Uh, by putting it in the cloud and keeping it there and only operating on it and accessing it through a workspace, you're protecting that data in a pretty fundamental way. It's simple to deploy and manage. We talked a little bit about this, but the idea of being able to do API-driven approaches is pretty critical for us, uh, and then being able to do it through console. And of course, uh, scale and consistent performance. 
So when we launched Amazon Workspaces, as I said, we were very worried about this perception that virtual desktops were not a great experience. And there are a few different factors that really go into that. One of the big ones is that a lot of the virtual desktop deployments that folks do on-premises are shared or oversubscribed instances. So they're shared session, heavily oversubscribed, and very oversubscribed on disk and network and CPU. So we gave every workspace its own full virtual machine. So just like EC2, all of these are getting dedicated CPU, RAM, disk, and network so that you get really consistent performance. Other vendors in the desktop as a service market are going different directions doing shared session, and it's challenging because there are significant performance problems that can be introduced from that approach. So always gonna see that uh, uh, approach from the uh, Amazon Workspaces side. So I know I've beat this uh, uh, horse to death a little bit, but what differentiates Amazon Workspaces from VDI? Well, obviously no hardware to buy. You're just using it out of the gate. This is so powerful. When you suddenly have a need for virtual desktops, you do an acquisition, you do a, a open a new office, uh, whatever that compelling event is, you don't have to go figure out how to do a hardware purchase for VDI. You just spin up workspaces. No software to buy. Now, obviously, you still, uh, we do a bring your own license offering, so you can buy Windows or you can buy uh, Microsoft's uh, Office products. Uh, you can buy any apps you want to put in the workspace, but at a fundamental level, if you just kind of want to launch a workspace today, we can include those licenses for you, and you can be up and running. There's no data center to manage. It's just running in the cloud, so that makes it nice and simple in that regard. It's API driven. This is really huge. So desktops have always been this thing that you have that's managed by a help desk and by an IT organization that kind of hands them out and tries to keep up with what sort of changes over time and what the end users have done. And uh, it just is this process driven thing, not really a, a program driven thing or not a technology driven thing. By converting this to being things that you're managing as servers and managing with APIs, the launch, the shutdown, the terminate, metrics, monitoring, it really converts your desktop estate from being something that's kind of hand-rolled to being something that you can evolve and you can invest in as a technology. And it's so really powerful that this stuff's API-driven. Our customers build incredible things on top of this. We see really neat outcomes of integration with their hiring processes, uh, with the way that they handle the employee process and workflow. So you can expand when you need, launch more. You can scale down when you don't need. We hear stories from customers all the time. We see usage drop for a particular customer. And that's great. As long as they didn't have a need for that, they turned it off. You don't own the hardware. You don't own the uh, software in a lot of cases. You can run globally. We're built on top of the incredible infrastructure that AWS provides us. So that's a whole bunch of data centers around the world. Uh, EC2, EBS, a lot of really nice core technologies that keep us running very effectively globally. Things like storage contention just don't really come up for us because we use EBS as the uh, block store for the uh, or root volumes and for the user data volumes. So we don't really see the types of disk contention issues folks have seen traditionally with VDI. And get started really fast. So again, very different to spin one up in 15 minutes versus trying to go stand up VDI. All right, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of background on why folks are moving to VDI. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the journey uh, as we see it and, and the process to move to it in a minute. Uh, but first, I wanted to invite uh, some folks up to talk about how they've done that journey. So Ramesh, you wanna join us? Ramesh joins us from Guardian Life. Really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk today. Thank you, Nathan. So this is Ramesh Tumar. I'm from Guardian Life uh, Insurance Company of America. Uh, Guardian, as you most of us know, uh, is a mutual insurance company and a financial service company uh, formed in 1860, and it's been there from past 158 years, uh, serving our customers with their financial needs and insurance needs. So here I'm uh, here to talk about Amazon Workspace journey uh, that we have done this year, we implemented uh, a few months ago, and uh, been operating stably from past few months. So basically, the strategy, right? I'm like, uh, why did we go to Amazon Workspaces? So in alignment with our cloud strategy, we, we, we had an opportunity to relook at our VDI infrastructure 
and, um, and after careful market research and pilot, we selected Amazon Workspace as our desktop as a service strategy. I mean, the goal of our Guardian's desktop as a service strategy is to deliver uh, a secure computing platform how, when, and where our employees prefer. So, so the Guardian had several use cases, um, I mean, use case and security requirements because it's a legal regulatory company. Uh, have to follow a lot of uh, uh, security compliance issues that uh, that creep up using a, a end user computing platform. So, what we focused along working along with uh, AWS uh, professional services is to address how do we address our development support and uh, functional areas. How do we give our offshore users a secure desktop? and our partners and vendors. And also satisfying our highly privileged administrative uh, functions. So architecting a solution with, uh, with highly secure requirements, which we only want to allow these workspaces to be accessed only from a known, known location. So as you all know, workspace is an internet facing. So we didn't want to allow uh, workspaces to be accessed from public, public, work, uh, public networks or home networks. And uh, we also need to satisfy our regulatory requirements, uh, which is kind of a key for our industry. And uh, the key item was also data leakage prevention. How do we prevent users to like, take our data into a different environment? That was another key item that we kind of like, uh, worked with our uh, AWS professional services and had group policies that we designed to prevent that kind of uh, leakage. So uh, this is a little bit of technical, but I actually wanted to share this uh, slide and uh, the learnings that we did through the journey of implementation. Uh, this is a, a design that we did for, for Guardian, but in general, it's the same for any customer who want to implement this. So we had uh, API systems, uh, which is a AWS preferred partner. We kind of collaborated with them in creating automation for workspaces. So there are like open APIs for workspaces and uh, through which you can like spin up workspaces. You can kind of onboard, offboard, uh, can increase drive uh, and increase the bundle like from standard to performance to per performance to, to power. So this orchestration was done using the APIs. And uh, one of the key items I want to like, highlight here is cost optimizer, right? Like um, as you're deploying, like uh, there, are, there may be users who may be using workspaces only for an hour or so. However, you are like uh, subscribed for a monthly bill, monthly model. Uh, that increases your cost. So there's a lot of opportunity for you to know how these workspaces are being utilized. So Amazon Cost Optimizer, which is kind of a, like we need to deploy using a, uh, uh, using a cloud formation template. Uh, it's not native to uh, the solution. It's kind of, uh, we need to download from GitHub and kind of deploy into your environment. Uh, that is something I would highly recommend that you deploy this prior to your rollout. We did after the fact, and, and we kind of realized that we should have done it prior. So that's one learning that we did. Uh, the other item is uh, elastic uh, network interfaces. Uh, workspaces comes with two interfaces. One is connected to Amazon VPC. Amazon manages that. There's communication goes from your workspace into uh, Amazon through that network interface. Uh, and there's another network interface that's connected to your uh, VPC where all the corporate access, your domain controller access, or file servers happen on that second uh, ENI. So, so it's critical that the first ENI should be healthy, like uh, actually both of them should be healthy. Uh, the first ENI is something Amazon manages, so when you connect through a client, uh, it actually goes through 
uh, the PC over IP connection from your Amazon client into their services. So if your agent, uh, which is managing the firewall or any man function uh, agent that is interrupting with the traffic on that ENI would disrupt that connection and uh, you will not be able to connect. That means your users will not be able to connect to workspaces. And, um, and you will have an unhealthy workspace. When you go into the dashboard, you see an unhealthy uh, workspace. So the only way you can get in is by RDPing from your network. So as I said earlier, I'm like, uh, the other ENI needs to be healthy as well. If that other ENI also goes bad because of some firewall issue or some client issue that's happening on the workspace, you are dead in the water. So you need to have some kind of like SCM job or any other like deployment tool to like repair uh, the, those issues. Uh, the third item is uh, IP restriction. Uh, there is an interesting item uh, that, that uh, Amazon Workspaces had, like probably sometime in April, end of April. We took full advantage of it. What it does is it actually gives that additional security. So as I said earlier, it's internet facing, uh, and anyone can connect from anywhere. Uh, what this IP restriction gives is it actually helps you whitelist only certain locations. So we only allow guardian known uh, offices or, or partner locations that connect to our workspaces. And the uh, a fourth item I want to mention is the peering. It's not new concept for any AWS customer about peering. Uh, what peering does is actually, actually allows you to uh, access the data or connections uh, between your accounts. Um, so what we did is we deployed uh, as a separate account and we have our shared infrastructure in a separate account, like SCCM deployments or AV. So there's a lot of bits that gets downloaded. So it's highly recommended that you do peering uh, if you have such kind of a uh, like design that you have peering, that way you can pretty much download from your own, otherwise it has to go through direct connect and go to the internet and come back. So it's a lot of like latency and also a performance hit. So, as I said, learnings, right? Like, uh, in the, uh, previously, I mentioned some technical learnings that we did. Uh, some of the other learnings that we had uh, is scale up and scale down. As Nathan mentioned earlier, uh, with workspaces, we can spin up like thousands of workspaces, and which is true. Uh, we actually did during our migrations. We have spin up hundreds and hundreds of workspaces in a day and, uh, and had our users log in. No issues there. However, if you want to downgrade your configuration, for example, you want to go from standard to uh, a limited uh, or performance to power, uh, sorry, uh, the other way. Uh, it's doable. However, if you want to, if you have increased drive space to like 100 gig, and you want to come back to like 50 or 10 gig, that's not doable. That's the learning that we did. It's a $4 hit on one workspace. So, so make sure you're aware of that. Uh, and change in mindset, right? This is, again, an like interesting topic. Uh, uh, with any cloud services, um, your budget model changes from CapEx to OpEx. So with rollout of workspaces, you're going to see uh, that, that your monthly, you're, you're hitting with a bill. So that's something uh, interesting for the senior management that they're seeing a monthly bill every, every month, rather prior to that they've been seeing a, a hardware refresh cycle of three to four years. So that's something, a change in mindset that uh, you're gonna see uh, like bills each month with your usage. As I said, cost optimizer would help to reduce that bill a little bit by usage, or if someone is not using it, you can pretty much turn that down. Uh, the other item in change in mindset is your engineers. Uh, so, in, in the past, right, like, uh, with traditional VDIs, uh, the engineers has full control fr from, from hardware layer to the operating system to the application layer. Uh, with introduction of workspaces, we lose that control, uh, anything below operating system. So if you have any issue uh, and you suspect that there it may be a blue screen, for example, uh, you don't have visibility to see what uh, a blue screen looks like. However, in traditional VDI, we can go into the console and take a look. Yeah, there's a blue screen. We don't have that visibility. So there is a call we need to make uh, to, to Amazon. So that's a change in mindset, right? Like, uh, 
we need to be prepared for that kind of support calls, uh, that we need to offload some of the issues that we've been like, able to fix it pr prior to introduction of workspaces. Now we have to like, work with Amazon to get that fixed. It's not hard. Uh, it's something uh, we've been like, consistently working. Our account team, uh, Tom Tomrock, I mean, is top on uh, any issues that we encounter. So it's a good journey that we had. Just want to like, uh, point that out to make sure you work with your account team. Um, and the other item is consider data location, right? Uh, that's, again, the key item when you're designing. Uh, you, you need to make sure that uh, your workloads, uh, there may be like access databases, like, which is not good uh, in, uh, in a brand uh, scenarios, or even uh, uh, in, in your LAN scenarios. So now you're like taking your workspaces onto the cloud, and if you have your huge access databases sitting in your um, data center in on-prem, uh, that's a challenge. I mean, you need to make sure that uh, you plan accordingly when you're like, designing for workspaces, that you make sure your data and your um, workspace to, are together, or at least in a low latency uh, environment. And the, the other thing was uh, the disaster recovery. Right? You know, like, uh, every company has different requirements for disaster, and everybody has a different perception of disaster recovery. Um, one thing I want to point out is um, with traditional VDIs, uh, you generally like, copy your VMDK files. Uh, you have like, different backup uh, procedures that you can like, take and fire up uh, the backup VMDKs. With uh, Amazon Workspaces, you lose that capability. And, like, uh, to begin with, Amazon has multiple regions, multiple AZs. Uh, uh, they have a good uh, DR practice. Uh, again, like, it depends on your uh, regulatory and compliance requirements. You need to perform a, a different region disaster recovery. In that case, you can't copy these workspaces into a different region. That's something uh, I think Amazon is working on. And uh, what's next for us uh, is, right, like, uh, we have done a lot of automation so far. And uh, we're trying to further enhance our automation using that uh, Amazon Workspace APIs and, uh, and also integrate our workspaces into our Launchpad, which is our Guardian Dolphin portal. Um, the other thing is, right, like, as I said, we have uh, uh, users in other locations. So, so we have migrated a fleet of users with some business requirements. Uh, now we are actually looking at our offshore workforce to get migrated into workspaces. And uh, also looking into the BIOD initiation. Earlier I said I mean, like we have some requirements for some use cases that we need to allow only from certain locations. Now uh, uh, There's another portion of users that needs flexibility, and that's our strategy. We, we, we are trying to unleash that and allow those workspaces from anywhere to be accessed. And uh, the final is, right, uh, uh, Remote app strategy is something we are kind of exploring using workspaces and also app streams. That's our journey. And uh, thanks, Nathan, and our account team, Anjana Neil Muir, and Tom Tomrick for. Awesome. Thanks. And like I said, we should have time, hopefully, at the end here for some questions so we can uh, uh, dig in there. Really appreciate that kind of uh, honest uh, assessment and uh, walking through that for us. So that journey that Ramesh described is a pretty common one that we see, the kind of process that they went through to adopt workspaces. So I wanted to talk about that and give maybe a little bit of a framework for the way that we think about that journey. So we really think about three phases. First is the build-out phase, then the migration phase, and then the operations phase. And so these are pretty linear. You go through this progression. Let's talk about the build-out phase. So this is when you've got to get workspaces ready to go. This, to me, is the kind of investment you make up front to get it integrated into your enterprise and your environment so that you're ready to go when you need it and you need to launch those workspaces. So this is going to be things like integrating with your Active Directory. We use directory services for a lot of this, for Active Directory Connector or Managed AD. It's going to be making sure authentication works. That's, again, AD, but it can also include integration with Radius, MFA servers, other solutions for doing MFA. Network access. So as Ramesh pointed out, uh, each workspace launches with a NIC, uh, an, a, a, a virtual interface, uh, as an ENI that's published into your VPC. So you control the uh, 
actual uh, security groups that are on top of that, and so you can control what it has access to. Do you want that workspace to be reaching out into your uh, intranet? Do you want it to have public network access uh, to, the, uh, to the internet? Those kind of decisions need to get made. Image creation, so you ha obviously most people have some sort of customization in the desktop images that they manage or use for their end users, so create those images. Particularly if you're doing things like bringing your own license, that's importing your images. So if you wanna use the Windows 7 or Windows 10 client images, then you do that import uh, in this phase. And apps management, so how are you getting apps out to the desktops? Are you using Workspace's application manager, which lets you do that, or are you using SCCM, or using other tools that are out there in the market? Our goal when we designed the product was to integrate with what you have, so a lot of those types of tools simply work. It's just a Windows desktop in most cases, so pretty straightforward. Once you've got it built out, you're ready to start actually onboarding users. This is the migration portion. So we see very different approaches here. Sometimes people say, I've got huge groups of users, I wanna move over all by November, and I'm gonna start that process now. Sometimes they say, I wanna have the end users opt in. Uh, and they can choose whether they want to become part of my bring your own device initiative and use workspaces. Um, so a lot of different options there, but fundamentally, you're gonna select some users. Who is it you're trying to migrate? That can include figuring out what their workspaces need to be in terms of sizing. So workspaces offer a number of different bundle sizes for hardware, so value, standard, performance, power, power pro, graphics, and graphics pro. Uh, and those have different disk sizes. You can always change the disk size, uh, but again, sizing it to match what it is that you think you need. Just to call it, this isn't really a one-way door. It used to be. You used to actually launch these and you were kind of stuck with what you launched. Uh, earlier this year, we changed that. So you actually can change what bundle type you're running on with a reboot. So pretty cool. You just get to reset, like getting a whole new laptop with a reboot. Uh, Data transfer, so how are your end users accessing the files they need on their desktop? A lot of people use some sort of cloud solution for this, so uh, obviously WorkDocs is a way to do that, but people use all sorts of other solutions for putting files from local laptops or other locations into the cloud and then accessing them from workspaces when they make that migration. And finally, you can't forget training and communication. So end users need to become aware that they're gonna be using a slightly different way of getting to their desktop. They need to be able to install the Workspace's client on their devices. They need to have some concept of who they're calling if they have a problem with that workspace. You may need to uh, inform your help desks and the other organizations that are gonna support workspaces. So there's some work to think through there. But you get all that done, and then you're finally into operations. So you've got workspaces up and running, they're configured properly, users are on them. Now you have desktops that are acting a lot like servers, and you've gotta manage those the same way that you would. So fleet management, I think Ramesh really uh, called out very well the fact that you have the opportunity to optimize the price and what you're spending for workspaces on an ongoing basis. So look at what end users are doing. Are they connecting? Are they using it? Are they not using it? Are they on the right size of workspace? And optimize that for cost reasons. That cost optimizer tool is available to you. Uh, it'll do things like detect how often a user is connecting and see whether it would be cheaper to convert them to always on or convert them to auto stop so you can save money. Monitoring and alarming, so again, these are a lot like servers now. So in the past, you used to have your laptops would get closed, you didn't have visibility to them from the IT side. Now, they're just always there if you want them. Even if they're uh, auto-stop workspaces, you can bring them up and you can start checking on them. Patching and Im image updates, this is still Windows or still Linux, they need to be securely updated. If you're using our images, uh, the standard ones, then we will patch uh, for those if you leave the default config in place. Uh, however, a lot of our customers do import their own client OS images, and so they have their own patching mechanisms, which typically match what they do on desktops. So whatever they've got on physical laptops or physical, physical machines is gonna look pretty much the same. Automation and integration, uh, Ramesh called it out, I called it out earlier, the APIs are there, people are doing a lot of this integration work, which is really cool. So uh, whether that's everything from image import uh, up into uh, provisioning of workspaces for new users, all kinds of things can be done uh, that way. We did have a really exciting announcement uh, last week, which was uh, bring your own license self-service. Uh, so this has been a process in the past when you went to import your client OS image, we had to get involved with you. Uh, now that's actually uh, something that you can do yourself through the console. And so gonna be quite a bit easier uh, over time if you need to update those images, which is pretty cool. 
end user support. So you've got to continue to have support for people who are running workspaces. Uh, it's still Windows, right? It still could have some issues inside of it, uh, or Linux in some cases. Uh, but one of the features we also launched last week was self-service end user actions. So if you look at the workspaces client, the latest one, you'll now see you have the option as an administrator to enable it through the console to do reboots, rebuilds, or upgrades of either the uh, upgrades or downgrades of the bundle type or expansion of the disk size. So a huge number of the types of issues that our end users might call the help desks for internally at our customers are now things that they can resolve themselves, uh, which is really powerful for reducing the load on the uh, teams that we work with from these IT organizations. So very excited about that. All right. So that's a little bit more about the journey, how people are undertaking it. I want to have one more example here. So Chris, if you would mind coming up and tell us a little bit about KPMG's journey and how you guys undertook workspaces. Thanks. You got the click. Cool. So hey guys, um, thanks for having me. So um, a little bit about me first. I'm, I'm Chris Astley, and I, uh, I've, I've got a really weird job title. I've introduced myself a number of times this week, and no one really seems to know what I do based on this. So I'll try and explain it. So um, basically, I'm responsible for a team of DevOps engineers and cloud engineers who build our internal cloud service that we build things on for our clients. And I'm also responsible for a part of our business that advises clients on how to consume those services themselves as well. So we try and take what we've learned to go and help clients on that journey. Um, but today, I'm going to talk to you specifically a little bit about uh, Amazon Workspaces and a quite an interesting use case, I think, that we had for it. So. Um, to talk about the use case to begin with. So um, <clears throat> this was for a, a global bank, um, as KPMG in, in our consulting practice. We do a lot of work with um, some pretty big banks. And this particular organization came to us and said that the biggest problem we've got right now in our organization is we do not know enough about our customers. So our regulators uh, beaten us up over this because the, we're not sure that we, we're preventing financial crime in the way we should. Uh, and we're not sure that our customers are the people we really want to be banking with us. Um, so we said, well, we can help you with that, and we can do a managed service end-to-end -to, -end to try and solve that problem for you. Um, but what that meant is uh, this, the speed that we had to stand the service up, we never would have been able to do it on-premises, so we looked straight to the cloud. Um, when we stood at the service, we had um, personally, personally identifiable information around 400,000 of their banking clients. Um, we had to deliver the initial environment within days so our development teams could, could get going on that. Um, and we really wanted to follow um, a DevOps and Agile methodology whilst doing this. This is how we work. Um, and it's really what we wanted to do um, in order to, to meet our, our objectives, really. Um, so we built that entire managed service, and that included standing up an operation of some 750 people in mainland China to reach out to those clients. Um, we didn't even have the building at the time we started, so that, that, was, that was a critical part for us. Um, and that design and deployment was approved by the bank's information security team. As it turned out, it was teams. There was 13 of those teams that I had to talk to for about six months of my life that I'll never get back, I'm sure. But um, that was actually a challenge, and it was also approved by their regulator. Um, so what I, I guess the message here is that doing this, this kind of stuff is perfectly possible in a highly regulated financial services environment. So some, some specific requirements around this. So. Um, this particular bank, the, the contracts it had with its, with its customers stated that their data would reside in the EU, despite the fact that um, a lot of them were over in mainland China and Hong Kong and in East Asia. Um, that's how the bank chose to structure themselves due to their on-premise facility. So we had to map to that requirement. Um, so we had an actual uh, outsource operation that was reaching out to those customers in mainland China, operating on data 6,000 miles away in Ireland. So that was an interesting challenge that we found. We needed it to support around 750 concurrent users, total population of 1,500. Um, and they needed all of the nice experiences that they would expect from a regular desktop. So they wanted dual screen experience, access to their productivity suites, Office, Skype, email, things like that. Um, and there was a whole bunch of tools they needed access to. Uh, and that included workflow for them to understand what questions they need to ask of, of this bank's customers. Um, what they should do next, depending on the results of those questions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we'd even integrated with their online banking platform for customers to go and upload that data um, in a more digital fashion. Um, and the operation needed access to the back end of all those tools as well. Um, and we also had to integrate with a telephony solution for, to allow those, those uh, workers to reach out to those customers via voice as well. So quite a complex environment. Now, 
as you might have guessed from that, the biggest challenge we had and, and our biggest enemy in all this really was latency. Um, now, we, we'd, we'd made a choice in order to ensure that that data continued to reside within, um, actually we chose Ireland as a region, so within the EU, um, that we would leverage VDI to give us very strong controls to ensure that that data remained where we wanted it to. Now, um, we knew, considering the distance, that latency was going to make that a very difficult thing to do with VDI. So we, we identified three potential solutions. We could stand up Citrix or Parallels on EC2, or we could leverage Amazon Workspaces. And actually, our, our primary, uh, the primary thing that we were really analyzing against was that latency to make sure that our users could be effective and were not affected uh, negatively by that latency. Now, um, I can tell you, obviously, those, those three solutions use different protocols. Citrix has, a, uh, has its own proprietary protocol it uses. Uh, Parallels uses uh, Microsoft Remote Desktop Protocol as its protocol, and Amazon Workspace is based on PC over IP. Now, what I can tell you is that uh, PC over IP is by far the least sensitive to latency of those three protocols. Uh, we did a lot of testing, and, and that, that's really what we found. Um, we found that uh, when, you, when you tip over about 290 milliseconds with workspaces, um, it starts to struggle somewhat, uh, but below that, you're great. Um, with something like Citrix, that you needed 250 milliseconds or less, uh, and, and Parallels, you needed far less than that even. That was, that was a real struggle for us. Um, and the initial testing we did, we, we went over the public internet. That was also a bad idea, as it turned out. Um, and, and the main thing wasn't necessarily the average latency we had, it was uh, how variable it was. So we could get latency of around 220, 240 milliseconds on one day, but we'd have 500 milliseconds the next day. And what that meant was we had a really variable experience for our users, and, and that didn't work for us either. So actually, the way we solved that particular problem is um, there's an Amazon partner called Ariaka who offer an MPLS circuit as a service. They're a really great partner, and uh, all you have to do is go over the public internet for the last mile at each end. Um, so it's effectively like a direct connect going um, across the globe for us. And that's where we got that really consistent latency. I think you can see on the chart here around 250 milliseconds. And that's, that's consistent, as you can see, over that's about a week or so in January. Um, and I also included the chart there, very similar to the one that uh, Nathan showed earlier. Um, that's what our peaky workloads look like. So super popular during the week, um, not so much on the weekend. So we, we, can, we can leverage all those benefits that Workspaces gives us around you know, being able to shut things down when we're not using them. Um, so yeah, so, so we went through all that testing and, and Workspaces was, was the clear winner for us actually. Um, it was really obvious just from a latency perspective. But of course, we found some additional benefits. Um, had we, had we uh, gone with either Citrix or Parallels, uh, we'd have still been um, standing that up in EC2 and managing the whole service end to end, and that would have cost us a lot more uh, on an operational standpoint. Um, and here's some of the ways that we've, we, we found that was better with workspaces. So um, we managed to automate the provisioning and patch management. Now, we didn't use the built-in patch management, actually. We, we want to take care of that ourselves. And there's, there's reasons from um, uh, an information security standpoint with our client and with our regulators that we need to take ownership of that. Um, but you can still automate it, right? You, you can put in good automation in the same way as you would with, with an on-premise uh, uh, VDI. So that worked really well for us. Um, and we've got that flexibility to pick the right pricing model. So actually what we find is that there's, um, that there's peaks and troughs over a year with this particular workload where we need to load a lot more users into our operation. So we could spin up users for only a few weeks in order to get over a hump and, and, and get a lot of cases processed. And this allowed us the flexibility to do that. So we could just spin new ones up and turn them off again when we're not, when we're not using them. And that meant no capacity planning. So we don't have to think about, do we need to rack and stack more servers to support that burst? Um, how is our storage doing? We didn't have to worry about any of that. And actually, one of the great benefits we had um, upgrading f uh, our version of Windows. So we went from uh, the idea that, we were, okay, we need to upgrade our version of Windows, Windows 7 to Windows 10, from having that idea to have executed it, it took us two weeks. And I, I have no idea how we'd have ever managed to do that in any other environment than, than, than what we could have had here in AWS. And actually, uh, making that change, we did literally overnight, and we had no issues the next day. So all of our users went to bed one evening, had Windows 7, woke up the next day, Windows 10. And of course, we had to do the, the, the little bit of training in the meantime, but fortunately, Windows doesn't, doesn't change so much in terms of the, that uh, access to applications, so that wasn't too bad. And you can tell that I wrote these slides before the announcement a week ago, um, so not coming soon anymore. I should say came last week, I guess. But um, So self-service, I think that's going to be a really great thing for us because um, that it reduces even further the operational workload that we have um, in order to, to help our users get, get access to new things. 
And uh, yeah, that's, that's it for me. So thanks for listening. All right, awesome. Thanks a lot. So uh, I, we're going to take some time for questions here. I did want to make a quick call out before uh, we get into questions, uh, which is that we do have another session on Friday, so uh, BAP 323. So again, a little bit more detail on moving desktops and applications to AWS with Amazon Workspaces and AppStream 2.0. So encourage everybody to do that. Um, also, uh, just before we get into questions, I'll encourage everybody to uh, fill out the uh, session survey when we're done here. Uh, we really need that feedback to help us make these sessions better over time, so appreciate that. Um, and with that, it looks like we've got uh, a good 15 minutes or so. Uh, so do you guys want to come back up? And then there are microphones uh, here in the aisle. So uh, if anybody has questions, then uh, we'd be happy to take them. If you'd rather do, uh, ask us questions uh, uh, off the uh, stage or uh, separately, that's fine as well. We'll be here for a little bit afterwards. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. So I have a, two questions, actually. One, do you guys support uh, Microsoft Intune yet? And two, is it necessary to have different accounts for different workspace security groups? Different workspace security groups. So, uh, we do not yet support Microsoft Intune. Uh, so the way that we work today is that we uh, can connect to your existing Active Directories uh, and existing managed ADs. So if you've got that sort of integration going on the other side of domain controllers, we, uh, we can work with that, but not directly into workspaces. Um, on, uh, what was the second question? It was. Uh, for security groups, like we have different, we have group, different groups of people that need different access to back on-prem services and we don't want to give them full access. Some will just need one access to one server, others will need access to the complete network. Okay, got it. <coughs> so the workspace's access itself is controlled by whether they have a workspace, whether it's provisioned, and then uh, their access in the domain controller, again, in Active Directory. Um, if We do have a lot of customers that will then route the traffic from the workspace through proxies and web filters and other things inside of their VPC. Uh, so if they've got that front-end ENI uh, configured to go through, uh, you know, blue coats or something else in, the, in that environment, they can then restrict that user to the uh, network segments or the URLs or the specific locations inside of their environment. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Just okay. yeah, we're uh, doing it a little differently. The, just want to extend, uh, expand your first question. You said uh, Azure, Azure AD or Intune? Uh, well, we have Intune machines, and we want to have contractors, it, rather than provide them with a laptop, have an Intune workspace so they can see what our users are seeing rather than having a full desktop at their, a full laptop at their site to use Microsoft Intune and support our users. Okay. A remote help desk, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Cool, thank you, sir. Uh, hey, so my, my question has to do with, it's a, more about graphical workloads. So how, how well does Workspaces work if you wanted to run like Maya or Blender or some 3D modeling application or maybe even playing a game on it? Not sure if that's possible. But I guess my yeah. question is with the graphical capabilities of Workspaces and then how low is it feasible to get the latency of, of the inputs? Yeah. So uh, we support uh, two different graphics bundles, Graphics uh, and Graphics Pro. Uh, and so those have got, got uh, NVIDIA cards in them, uh, GPUs at various sizes. The Graphics Pro is obviously quite a bit larger, and it's a, a little bit more modern GPU. Uh, and so the uh, only other real difference between the two is that the Graphics Pro will support multiple monitors as well. Uh, and so we do see people do Maya and those kind of workloads in that environment, particularly to keep it close to the other data sources it needs to use. Uh, and so we'll see that kind of rendering and visualization combination with EC2 and other tech, uh, which is nice. Uh, the in-session experience is good. You just recognize that the bandwidth does increase as you get into those high you know, 4K dual monitor, you know, high 3D, uh, high frame rate situations. So uh, instead of hundreds of kilobits a second of transfer, you might be into the megabits of transfer uh, pretty easily. Latency can go pretty low, so if you're geographically close to where your workspace is running, so let's say that you're in Washington, D.C., connecting to U.S. East, you're going to find that's tens of milliseconds, and it's going to be super fast and responsive. Um, and generally, most of the places where we have those graphics instances, um, you know, they're near major metropolitan areas, so you should be able to find a pretty good mapping to that. Okay, thanks. Okay. So one of our current uh, uh, flagship uses of our VDI environment is for uh, our computer labs for all of our students. Um, cool. With about 6,500 total students across various programs, and provisioning a dedicated desktop for each of them is fairly far out of scope for budget for a small private <laughs> EDU. Yes. Um, 
what advice would you have? Because we really like the idea of what Workspaces does. Yeah. But uh, the, the current model that I'm seeing is not something that, that kind of fits within that ephemeral, yeah. you know, we might have a student that never uses the labs and a student who's in there every day and having to provision that yeah. for the off chance that they may use it. It's a little expensive. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the, the, to, in today's product world, the answer is AutoStop Workspaces. There is still a per user, per month fee with AutoStop Workspaces today. That goes down as low as $7. When you're talking about 6,000 users in the education environment, that money still adds up. Uh, mm -hmm. We get that. We get this feedback regularly. That feeds into our thinking process on roadmap. So uh, it's a good data point for us. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I would say for now what we see is in our education space, we do have a lot of customers using it and doing uh, lab replacements mm -hmm. uh, and uh, doing other tactical actions. And that would be kind of my recommendation is figure out which classes it makes sense for to do always on or auto stop rather, mm -hmm. uh, and then keep the feedback coming. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, uh, how is printing accomplished? You know, for example, yeah. we have like mobile users. You know, different places. You know, yeah. they're trying to print mm -hmm. documents. I know uh, corporate users. It might, it might not be a, uh, as big a challenge, but. For, yeah, individual. Well, here, I want to hear what you guys are doing as well. But in general, there are two ways to print from workspaces. So uh, domain join printers uh, through Active Directory are the uh, enterprise way we mostly see getting used. Uh, so that's really straightforward. Uh, there are, is also possible to directly connect a local printer. Uh, so if you've got a, uh, any kind of a serial or USB or legacy uh, um, place, uh, uh, ports that you're mounting that, connecting that printer through, uh, you actually use either a, a specific print driver or the universal print driver in the workspace, and then the local machine has to have the print driver as well to be able to communicate to that printer. Um, but the printing flows right through uh, and works. I will say there's technically a third way, which is web printing. So we actually do have people who just use the web printing services and associate printers directly to web printing. What, what are you guys doing? Yeah, we block uh, local printing. <laughs> by default, Got it. and we only allow net for printing. Yeah. So we have corporate net for printers. So mm -hmm. that's we one block of our... all printing. So we block all printing. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> so all right. good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> is it suitable for developers uh, who want to uh, well install their development tools mm -hmm. and deploy their application to 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 run tests uh, locally? Is it yeah. suitable for developers? Yeah, yeah. So we have a, a pretty good uh, developer community. Do you, you guys want to yeah, talk about Yeah, I, I would like to answer that. Right? And like as, uh, as Nathan mentioned, we have different <coughs> types of bundles. Um, dollopers requires more powerful, and uh, it's a persistent desktop. So you can definitely provision a dollopers grade uh, workspace and user could like either you as an admin provision those development tools or user can install by themselves if they have admin access. Yeah. Right. So yeah, we yeah. don't we don't see any challenges. Uh, the only thing is, right? I'm like if they compile the code, uh, just want to make sure that the code is closer. And like generally, with some uh, CVS tool, we're having on local compile it and then upload it. That's the only challenge I would see if your data is too far away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have offshore development teams in India um, and also in Portugal, uh, and we use it for that for that particular purpose as well, yeah. just to make sure that the, the access is restricted. But they, they don't they certainly don't complain to us about any performance issues or yeah, um, yeah no complaints. Okay, yeah. thanks. Uh, yeah. what, what Linux distributions are supported? Uh, Amazon Linux. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is a is a quick one. Is uh, S S Haml um, on the roadmap to be supported? Mm -hmm. So this is uh, being able to do single sign-on effectively into the workspace, or are you right. talking about inside? Yeah, um, it's a it's a frequent feedback point uh, for us. It's something we're definitely looking at a roadmap. I will say that the challenge has been. Um, the necessity to execute a Windows login. Uh, so you actually need an AD, username, and password. Uh, if you guys have used AppStream, you can see the other option here, which is that they've done the, uh, the SAML integration pieces. Right. It sort of requires the secondary login step. Uh, so you kind of have this trade-off. So we're actively looking at that. And so good to get the feedback, if that's what you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, that question of, do we take that same approach that, that AppStream has done? Because we do hear positive feedback on that. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah and then I also uh, wanted to ask to ask uh, ask uh, uh, you two um, how how uh, you guys approached um, authentication, I identity management, and um, MFA in, in particular in your deployments. Mm -hmm. so, well, I'll, I'll yeah, you go first. I can go. 
Uh, so in the architecture diagram, I explained, right? And like uh, you have uh, integration to your Active Directory. So there is an ADC that connects to your Active Directory. You can configure that. And you also have an option to configure MFA on the directory level. Um, so all those configuration can be done. Um, those are the two authentication methods, AD and MFA. As yet, we're the same. We also use the certificate-based authentication. So you load the certificate on the local desktop, and that authenticates in an extra level. Um, we use Jamalto for the uh, MFA tokens. We've got hard tokens and soft tokens through that service. And we, yeah, we, we run the back end for that on EC2 as well. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the common pattern that we see uh, is, is exactly that for an enterprise users. Um, we also recently launched URI capabilities, so you can actually uh, create your own portal where people can log in directly through that portal using whatever mechanisms you want, and then you publish out a URI that initiates the workspace login. Uh, so there's some security implications there to think through, but there are some options there if you want to go different directions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to belabor the point unnecessarily, but there's a... Um, when an organization has maybe 35 or 40 percent of their users active at one time, they're going to look for a concurrent user model, yeah. and um, that would be uh, that would be a, a lovely thing to see. Um, yeah, something good, I good would thing. like I would like to ask you to speak to is how do you handle what what are your go-to solutions for um, portability of like user environment data? In order to you know, say a desktop needs to be burned down and the user needs to go into a new desktop, mm -hmm. what's what are the solutions there? Can you talk through that? Right. So if you're talking about inside of the workspaces context, so they've already got a workspace and you want to you know, reset, uh, our primary mechanism there is a rebuild. And so when you do a rebuild with workspaces, the C drive, which contains the user profile information, uh, is all preserved. So we, we uh, uh, I'm sorry, the D drive, rather, which contains all of the user profile information is all preserved. The C drive is, is blown up, which is the, where the root uh, of the file system is. Uh, and so that preserves most of the types of things people care about, apps and data, uh, and we set up the configuration so that uh, all of those pieces are, are really uh, tried to be homed in that D location. Um, it's, uh, of course, always possible things get into the C drive, and so there can be some impact there. Um, if you're talking about coming from outside of a workspace, then there are tools that are out there, third-party solutions that do this. Uh, so Liquidware, for example, uh, does some of these types of things. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of customers do that for migration from on-prem into workspaces uh, using those third-party solutions. I don't know if you guys did anything in this space. Yeah, we, we have a third-party tool called Ivanti uh, Workspace Manager. Uh, it's a profile management solution. So it actually transfers uh, the profile from desktop to virtual desktop or uh, a Citrix environment, that one thing. And as Nathan mentioned, uh, we put all our uh, core configuration into D drive, which is preserved. Even though we rebuild it, uh, those configuration files are there. And the applications are streamed through AppV. So a user can rebuild it, and uh, it's 90% of the, of the users has the streaming capabilities. And there, are, as I said earlier, there are development users who install the software. They lose the software if they rebuild it. What was the name of the product? Uh, AppV, Microsoft AppV, was oh, the streaming service. Okay. The profile management product. Uh, Ivanti. It's Ivanti. formally called RES. OK. Or yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Fan yep. Fantastic. Thank you. Cool. All right. Hi. Thank you. Yeah. My organization has a fairly mature uh, Amazon Workspaces solution, but cool. we run into a couple main issues uh, with regards to user adoption. Yeah. And the challenges that we've had are mostly around uh, we're, we're very collaboration focused, and so we use Skype heavily, yes. have a lot of uh, voice and, and uh, video through Skype. So yes. uh, first question, I guess, is how are you planning to approach the optimization and compatibility of webcam and video and audio? Yeah. So uh, great feedback. Uh, this is probably the single most common bit of feedback that we get is that folks want better quality for audio that are going through the workspaces, and they want support for inbound video so they can do video conferencing. Uh, so that's definitely high on our list of things that we're looking at as, uh, as part of the product definition. Uh, in the immediate term, the, the most important thing I would say on audio is headsets. Uh, so uh, as strange as it is, there's a lot of reasons that for virtual desktops, doing uh, microphones uh, and speakers near each other uh, really can't take advantage of some of the um, noise canceling and echo cancellation that exist in native clients. So headsets help eliminate a lot of that. Uh, and then, of course, you know, having relatively low latency helps uh, in the current environment. Uh, so making sure you're not too far in terms of the geographic distance from the workspace uh, where it's running. But 
we definitely have plans on improving this over time. Okay, uh, last question about that. With uh, user migration and the challenges with, with data location, mm -hmm. uh, what is a, a, a way that has worked for you in the past or that you'd recommend looking at to be able to identify specific types of data? Maybe they would be more tolerant of the latency issues and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Access databases were mentioned as being something that you struggle with. Right. Uh, so is there a, a good approach or a way you'd recommend to look mm -hmm. at that uh, as we yeah. continue to, to move that data to the cloud over time. Yeah, so uh, uh, file shares, access information, the, the SharePoints, all kinds of things that, that need access that are particularly chatty. Uh, and you know, first off, there's not clearly enough a right or wrong here. The reality is you probably optimized those locations in terms of where the file shares are and where the desktops are over the course of many years to be what they are. Now you're taking one of those components and moving it somewhere else. and so. There's impact there. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there's a trade off to be made. Your question you have to ask is how much latency do I want to accept in the workspaces session connection and how much do I want to accept in that application connection? We've generally found that workspaces itself is more tolerant of the latency for the session uh, than a lot of those apps are. So, our general advice is put the workspace near the apps and near the data. Uh, if the user is 200 milliseconds away from the workspace, that's okay. We can handle that. Uh, but if you're 200 milliseconds away from where your access databases are, that may actually be a problem. Okay. okay. Thank you. I think we got time for one more quick one. We're right at zero here. Yeah, and this one is quick. Um, I'm interested in uh, the the um, business case. Uh, what kind of clients do your companies use to motivate the investment in the workspaces? Yeah. So uh, we see a wide range, obviously. So there's a lot of people that use it for using AWS services, or just connecting and using things and developing an EC2 or other AWS product. Uh, but we see a lot of people using it for what we kind of call edge of network cases. And I think your cases kind of fit in here, which is places where you've got consultants or contractors, places where there's segmentation and ownership between client device and the environment they're going to be connecting to, uh, places where you've got variability, you know, mergers and acquisitions, ups and downs. Uh, a lot of those cases are, are out there. Um, and that's not to relegate us to just those cases, but there's a lot of that, a huge percentage of desktops that are out there that fall into that category. So I assume you guys are kind of in the same boat. Yeah, totally agree, totally yeah. agree. They're, they're the low-hanging fruit for us, really. They're the ones that it's easiest to get the value back. So. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I was interested because we did a try a few years ago and, and we stumbled on the cost. Uh, uh, <coughs> it was, like you say, consultants coming in and we didn't want to give them laptops. So we were trying to use the uh, competing firm starting with a C. Yeah. But the cost, it, that was more high. expensive than simply giving them a brand new laptop. Okay. Well, we'd love to sync offline and see if we can figure out why. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.